Welcome back to another On The Whistle AFCON Daily Digest and for our sixth and final preview pod. Today we're looking at Group F featuring Tunisia, Mali, Mauritania and Deputants the Gambia. Thanks so much for listening to our preview pods. If you want to keep up with all our On The Whistle content as we go through this wonderful tournament, make sure to follow and subscribe. That's OTW underscore podcast to find us on Twitter and Instagram and On The Way To Soul podcast on Facebook, YouTube and audio wherever you get your podcast. First up, to get the load down on Tunisia, I spoke to Tunisian and African football expert Lot Viwada and asked him how preparations have been for the tournament. I think we had a, a good preparation with the Arab Cup, which was used and was seen as a perfect uh, preparation. And, uh, you know, we we'll just have one friendly game, which explains everything. I think it has been a good preparation because we faced team of, uh, of, a, of a big caliber, notably Algeria. We faced Egypt and even uh, Oman in the, in, the, in the quarters. So mm-hmm. I think it has been a good preparation and it has helped also massively uh, some players uh, to 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 pick their their ticket for Cameroon thanks to this uh, to this uh, to this uh, tournament because you know uh, players like for instance uh, Raylan Charleli or even uh, Mohamed Ben Ben Hamida they weren't supposed at all to 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 go to Cameroon but thanks to their performances in this uh, in this Arab Cup they managed to pick a, a, a ticket for the for the for Cameroon and and obviously some uh, some players who who fared less better um paid the price for their for their for their for their poor uh, Arab Cup mm-hmm. yeah I, I just wanted to talk about that cuz one of the you know you know fascinating things for me looking at the squad list was the the omission of uh for Jenny Sassi um yeah now as someone coming from the outside you know I haven't seen much of him since since he moved to Qatar but when he was at Zamelec he was you know one of if not the most classy and technically gifted midfielders and in, in, you know in Africa you know what what has happened that he suddenly dropped out of you know dropped out of the team entirely well, uh, as you perfectly remarked, it's one of the main two majors uh, omissions of the of the of the list, as uh, as you know and as you perfectly remarked. Again, Fejani Sassi was one, uh, if not the, the most uh, classy midfielder in Africa when he was playing at Zamalek. You know, he stacked with his experience. He has a seventy cap, something like this. He was part of all uh, of all national team squad. I think since maybe he he emerged to. Uh, to the face of African football in 2015. Uh, since then, he was present at the Afcons, he was present at the World Cup also, and he was even present uh, lately at the Arab Cup. So his uh, omission was a major, a major surprise, and I think he was omitted because he had, um, I would say, a, a, a poor, uh, relatively average, I would say, uh, Arab Cup, and he paid the price, and he was replaced, numerically speaking, in a certain way, by Raylan Charleli, who, on the other side, Played a much uh, had a, a much better Afcon than him, and also added to that, there were rumors that he didn't have much uh, good links with the with the with the FA, and also he has been uh, tested positive to COVID, etc. So maybe it it played a role uh, in this, but it's an absolutely major omission. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's unthinkable in a certain in a certain way. You know, when you when you put things. Uh, uh, out of context, you know, it's unthinkable to 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 get rid of a player who is stacked with experience. As I said he has 70, 70 caps. Uh, he has played uh, every every tournament, uh, every recent tournament with uh, Tunisia. He has uh, a certain profile. You know, he's a deep lying playmaker, uh, a certain profile that no, we we don't have. And technically, you know, he's very good. So he has been. It's uh, a major omission and one of the two major. Uh, omissions in in the list absolutely mm-hmm. uh, i i think uh you know looking at the list the other ones that jumped out for me um and particularly for those watching the afcon from from a european audience is the inclusion of hannibal medbri and um and omar rekik obviously the the younger brother of karim rekik uh you know neither of them really have made any you know inroads into making appearances for manchester united and arsenal um, why do you think they have been picked to, to join the team? Well, uh, Meshbury has been picked uh, on his uh, Arab Cup campaign, you know, mostly. 
uh, because uh, you know he was uh, promised to be to be there and to be included in the list by the by the federation in a certain way to be politically correct or whatever. Um, he has been there because of that, and then he fared pretty well at the at the Arab Cup, to be honest. But for Omar Rekik, I think it's an absolutely uh, political choice without any doubt because there's no sporting reason or sporting criteria to defend such uh, uh, an inclusion because he hasn't played i think correct me if i'm wrong he has never played senior football for arsenal mm -hmm. he's uh, he's not you know he's not a, a, a maldini in the making or whatever and he has been called up and uh, i think it's definitely one of those uh, one of those inclusions which have been done by the president of the FA and, me, and his friend, uh, the scooter, who is scooting players from the diaspora just to please them. And, you know, uh, um, and, you know, I think it's because of that. And it's laughable, uh, to say the least, to, to, to see such uh, an inclusion because on the sporting aspect, there's nothing this player can can bring, and uh, it reminds a bit of the of the former of a, a similar case in the past. You know, there was at 2019 a player, Mark Lamty, who was playing in Bayer Leverkusen uh, second team, if I'm not wrong, or, or academy, and he was included, God knows how, in the in the final list for the tournament. And I think he didn't play or play very few, so it's a very similar case, and it's just a political uh, a political. Uh, uh, call up, if I can say that, to please uh, Mr. The, the almighty and all-powerful Scoot and, uh, and the FA, which has been imposing such such ridiculous and pointless uh, call, calls up uh, since a long, long time. Hmm. No, that, that's really interesting to hear. I mean, do, do you think that the, the inclusions of the people and perhaps this interference, has it impacted kind of the preparations at all for, for the Cup of Nations? Or is it more just a, a side thing, you know, one or two players have, have been brought in, um, but, but the team is still preparing very well for the AFCON? I think uh, it's uh, a side thing, and uh, and it had an impact. It had an impact, you know, on the um, on the popular, uh, I would say, on the popular point of view of the of the fans, because mm. the fans, and you you saw you saw the outrage it created when the list uh, was uh, published yesterday at uh, at midday. Uh, the for instance the um, the uh, the second major absence of the list, which was the absence of Wesley Kashirida, he has been uh, he has been uh, not uh, he, he wasn't called up for God knows which reason again, and uh, and he created a certain outrage because you know he's hardworking etc cetera, etc cetera, and he was omitted and he was he was replaced by a player who is playing at Jamalek Methluthi who hasn't uh, you know he's not the same caliber maybe. Maybe the, this choice, for instance, can be uh, defended by the fact that Methruti is uh, more defensive, you know, he's more def uh, defensive uh, for, uh, right back. But uh, except that, there's no reason why he should uh, take the play the place of, uh, of a player like Wesley Kashfrida. But, you know, uh, for the rest, I think they are preparing very well, even even if, you know, there will be just one uh, one friendly. This, uh, this, um, this Arab Cup has been... Uh, has been a, a good run, and mm -hmm. we will see what, how we will fare in, the, in a pretty tough uh, group. Uh, obviously, in a pretty balanced group, if I can say not tough but balanced group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I mean, just just looking at the group, you know, you have you have a very very strong, potentially very strong Mali side, um, and then Mauritania and Gambia, who have both been you know very much overperforming uh, in the last couple of years and have done brilliantly to qualify for uh, for, for the tournament. I, we're looking at the tournament as a whole. You know what are what are the expectations from the fans from the FA on on the team? You know what are what are their expectations for them to do at this tournament? I think well, uh, the first step will be definitely uh, to get out of this group. Obviously, to qualify, it shouldn't be logically logically it shouldn't be a, a difficult task because mm -hmm. you know we can definitely finish. Uh, good for uh, we can definitely finish at worst uh, third best uh, third uh, best place team in the in the in the group or we can definitely finish first or second and there will be calculations because I think uh, if you finish second you you will play the the second team of the um, of Senegal group if I'm not wrong so in a certain way it would be better to finish second than in a, than than first. Uh, and, uh, and 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 face I think Ivory Coast or something like this it would be um, so yes uh, the expectations you know we we call we we did God knows how uh, reach the 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 semifinals in 2019 in a very strange run marred with some uh, very weird events I think you all remember that 
So why not? Uh, I think I would be very happy if in those three months, because you know it's a cycle, we, for instance, reach the final of Arab Cup, we reach, let's say, the semi final again of, of, uh, of AFCON and then qualify for World Cup. I think it would be a very formidable run and, uh, and a very good thing to, and a very good uh, cycle to, uh, to, to salute, I think. Even mm -hmm. if it's smart by, by, uh, with problems, etc., it would be very good on the sporting aspect. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, just just to finish off, I wanted to ask, you know, going into the tournament, obviously, there's been a lot of, you know, confusion, a lot of controversy around around the team and the squad list in particular. You know, when the tournament starts, if you had to pick out one or two players that people who aren't familiar with Tunisian football, particularly to watch out for, um, you know, who would those players be? I think well, I think uh, the, the the midfield uh, the midfield will be uh, where I think we have our best players because we will miss in the defense. We will miss uh, Yassin Meriah who has torn his ACL during the the final against Algeria against Algeria or in the semi final I think. Uh, so uh, I think in the midfield we will have uh, players who will uh, who will stand out. I would say definitely uh, Isal Aydouni who has been very good at Fering Varosh. I think definitely his style is uh, is made, you know, for the tournament. You know, he's very physical. He has a good, uh, huge stamina, etc. And technically, he doesn't fear. He doesn't have problem. Um, I think this player for me will stand out. And obviously, we have a few artists. Um, maybe also uh, Skiri also will will do well. And uh, I think Mohamed Ali Ben Ramdan was been maybe a Tunisia Tunisian league best best player. Mm -hmm. Can have a word to see if he plays because uh, you know he has been a. Uh, what the the, be, the best midfielder with uh, Aliou Dieng in the last Champions League without a doubt and uh, I think if he he starts or if he gets a, a good uh, a good number of minutes he will definitely show even more uh, he will show what we see in uh, on the African scene to the to the to the international eyes. Tunisia certainly are an excellent tournament team and a side that no one will want to face. Up next, one of the potential dark horses of this AFCON, Mali have come into the tournament in excellent form and boast a very potent lineup. I asked Malian journalist Drissa Nyono how they have come to this point. Uh, for, for, before starting, we want to, do, uh, we want to say that uh, in uh, 2017, uh, the team were managed by Alain Gires. He failed 6-0 at Morocco and he, he make uh, no no at Venti Mars in Bamako. After this result, uh, uh, Mali Authority Football uh, make a decision to, uh, to, to, to fire him, mm -hmm. to fire him and replace him by uh, Mohamed Magasuba. Magasuba came and uh, he, he built a team with uh, a young player, young player which were uh, in a, a World Cup competition uh, of uh, 11, uh, uh, 11 uh, World Cup of U, U 11, uh, 11 mm. in, uh, in India, I mean, and also there were young which uh, uh, have a success in uh, Afghan, in, in Niger and Gabon also. Uh, the team it did about this young player among them, the uh, Musa uh, Dubia, the Musa Jenepu, and also Jaji Samasiku, Amadou Aydara, Jigi Jara. They were mm -hmm. played together in young uh, Mali young national team. And uh, he, he, he he is all he were he was uh, the DTN of the uh, uh, federation, and also it is, he is a uh, team manager, and uh, he. he he have a fix of this young player to be and uh, uh, build something with them. And we know that it was not uh, uh, simple. He, he, he started with uh, uh, 2019 qualification where he was uh, first in group uh, D, I think, uh, B, B, in front of Burundi and Gabon. Mm -hmm. Burundi and Gabon, he qualified for the Afghan in Egypt, but in Egypt, he fell at a uh, second uh, turn against uh, Cote d'Ivoire. And uh, he, he, have, he continued to fit uh, with this young player. And today, he think that with uh, this team, he can do something. It's the reason why he, he selects the majority of the young player 
and he has fits of them. And today he have the, the results uh, in uh, two, uh, 2000 and uh, fit, uh, 2021 qualification mm -hmm. in Cameroon and this uh, uh, qualification of uh, the second turn or third turn of uh, World Cup qualification. And it is a, a, a young uh, spike, but uh, if you analyze well, uh, in 2019, there were 25th, 25th uh, player which play in uh, Egypt, with, who will be uh, this year with the team. Mm. And, and also there, there are two players which play in 2017, it's, I mean, uh, Charles Traoré and Yves Bissouma, who oh, they were they were not in uh, Egypt, but they will be this year. And also, eleven new players which come with the group, and he think that he can do something better with uh, this team. Mm. No, it's it's a very exciting time for for Mali. Um, one thing that happened during the very successful World Cup qualifying was the the players protested because they they weren't being paid their. Uh, their bonuses for qualifying for the Cup of Nations. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I, the, it, it was a World Cup qualification, but they have a discussion uh, with uh, Amari Traoré, Amari mm -hmm. the captain, and Jaji Samasek, the vice captain. They mm -hmm. talk with uh, Mali Minister of Sport, uh, Musa Agata. They have a solution, but he paid before they going to, uh, to Saudi Arabia for the preparation of Afcon. Mm -hmm. He paid off. Uh, the prime of uh, Afghan qualification, but uh, it's waiting now. Uh, thing is about uh, World Cup qualification, and it say that uh, the time of the World Cup qualification competition that we talk about this or prime, and that also will be paid. But well, the things about uh, the prime about uh, Afghan qualification. All uh, the paid mm -hmm. before they're going to Saudi Arabia. Uh, now there are no problem about uh, prim, uh, uh, protests between Mali authority and Dyer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so now things have been sorted in, in the buildup. Hopefully they can have a, uh, exactly, a smooth thing. Exactly. Mm. I, the, the, I suppose the, the other very big question coming into this tournament is yeah. the inclusion of Is Busuma because obviously he. He quit the he wasn't a part of the national team for over three years, um, and he's been brought back into the team now. Uh, why do you think? Oh, hello. Hello, I'm here. I'm here. You're I'm here. Here, here. Good, good. I'm yeah. So, so my question is, why? Oh. What happened to Yves Busuma? Yeah, why did he? Connection. I mean, they mean. Oh, sorry. Are we okay? Okay, I'm here. Okay, good. Um, my, my next question is, is, uh, is around Yves Busuma, because obviously he hasn't played for three years and, and has now yes. been, been called up. Why did he initially, why was he dropped initially by, by the coach, Magasuba, and why has he now been, been called back? The, the problem with Busuma was he was ill. He was ill in his shoulder. Mm -hmm. And you think that uh, no... Uh, Magasuba no uh, Fusini Jabati called him to uh, to have information about him. Mm -hmm. And we, when he was, uh, the problem with Salt, he starting to play with Brighton and they call him to play. This It's not the way that he uh, think could be. Uh, I, after the uh, discussion with his, uh, his agent, uh, Michel Cho, Mm -hmm. They talk about the problem, uh, and, and I think now the problem is solved. But before he selects again Ibisuma, the decision with them, and now uh, the player accept to come back and play with the national team. But he say that uh, the problem has been that uh, he was ill where the team was in Africa and Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, at this time, uh, they have no call, and uh, they have no discussion with him. And uh, he's a uh, manager, Mohamed Marasuba. Then after, when he be uh, treating the shoulder problem, he's treating and salt, he's starting to play and play. the coach called him. It is, it is the reason, the way, the manner that things uh, were going that he didn't accept. But after there had mm -hmm. been a, a, a discussion with them, uh, and the Malian uh, Federation President Mam Tuturi, and now the problem is solved. If 
if he is attempting to be with the, his teammates uh, the 5th of uh, the new year in uh, January 5th, mm -hmm. uh, 5th January, uh, after playing with uh, Brighton mm -hmm. against uh, an FA Cup town or an FA Cup of, uh, a town. Then after this game, he will be with his teammates in Saudi Arabia before going uh, to Limbe and play Afghan with Mali. Mm -hmm. I mean, moving on to the squad, I, I look at the Mali squad and there's some unbelievable talent there, you know, particularly that, that midfield. You know, we, we talked about Bisuma, you know, Amadou Bisuma, Haidara, Gadi, Samasuko, Samasuko La, yeah, La, Kamara, La, uh, even Aliou Jiang, you know, has been playing brilliantly for Alapoli. Yes. You know, how how far do you think Mali can go in this tournament and, and what are the expectations for them? It, it's the mid uh, the, the player of this, uh, the, it is this player with, who are Mali uh, strong points. Mm -hmm. uh, because we, we, we know that in uh, de defend, uh, in at the defense, the problem because he played with uh, uh, Faleh Sako. Faleh mm -hmm. Sako is uh, a, a left back player, but he played with him in a uh, central back and let mm -hmm. Mamadou Fofana uh, on the bench. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think uh, the uh, a friendly game he will play against Cote d'Ivoire, Como, and also Malawi. Mm -hmm. He will do something to, to, to resolve them. But in midfield, we don't we know that uh, we have Mali have uh, a lot of talented players, and it is uh, the choice made by the coach will be uh, the problem. But we think that he, he will manage all correctly and choose the best player and play with them in the uh, Medifar. But the question is about uh, also, uh, also uh, forwards, because uh, he, he, have, he has uh, m m uh, Ibrahim Kone in mm -hmm. later, but uh, he, after Ibrahim Kone, uh, El Bilal Touré didn't have this experience of uh, the strong uh, physically to to face a, a defender like uh, Kalidou Koulibaly of mm. Senegal or I mean uh, the Algerian defender player but we think that it, it, it is the way to manage the two a case the defender problem and uh, forward problem is it has a solution about do uh, these two things, uh, we think that Mali can do a, a better competition. But in midfield, we know that we have players which, which can play a good football, and uh, we didn't care about uh, our uh, midfield player uh, skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, so coming now in into the tournament, uh, we were speaking before that there's a lot of expectations on on this Mali team. You know, they they're a yes. young team but very talented. Um, and, and so f f for the Federation, have they set a target for what, what position they need to come? Uh, at this competition, Mali need the cup. Mm -hmm. after, 50, after 50 years, they, they say that after uh, in, in 1972, mm -hmm. Mali in 1972, Mali played his first Afghan competition in Cameroon. They attend the final by last final. Mm -hmm. And uh, two years uh, or one year ago, they played against uh, Morocco against in final. And they say if there are two tapes, uh, it will be a first, uh, a, a, a first time. Uh, and also they, they think that with the squad that Mali have now can do something better. And if the object of the team is to be in the semifinal and after uh, believe and uh, also dream to have a final and win uh, this competition uh, at the uh, final stage. If Mali could finally do it and win an AFCON, it would be a truly an amazing feat. On to Mauritania. 
Unfortunately, the man we've been trying to talk to, Brahim Sodia uh, Dana, the media officer and community manager at the Mauritanian Football Federation, hasn't been able to find the time to talk to us so far with the team busy in Cameroon. We apologize for that and we'll look to bring an interview with him later on in the tournament because Mauritania are a team that we should all be talking about. Just over a decade ago, they were the worst ranked side in the world and now they've qualified for back-to-back -back AFCONs and are only going up. If you are a Mauritanian football fan and want to talk, uh, talk about your national side, please get in touch with us through our social media pages. We'd love to have you on. This brings us to our final side in the group, the Gambia. Another truly brilliant story in this AFCON's wonderful Af tapestry, making their debut as the smallest country on mainland Africa. In order to find out how they've been so successful, I spoke to the man behind it all, head coach Tom Sanfiet. Yeah, my, my, my passion for, for Gambian football was already long existing. In, in uh, 2002, I was uh, coaching in Faroe Islands as a young coach, and I brought uh, the first African player to Faroe Islands, and it was a Gambian. And with him, I was in touch with some Gambian national team players. And since that moment, I was really eager to work once in uh, the future for Gambia. Also in 2010, when I played with Namibia against uh, the Scorpions in Gambia, I was impressed with uh, the emotion and the fans. And, and I thought, once I want to coach here. And in 2018, after I left Malta, I got a phone call from, from someone in Gambia if I was not interested in, in, in the job. And uh, I didn't have to think uh, twice about it. First of all, I very short checked what was the potential uh, and it's right uh, between 2013 and 2018 they had won only one match um, but I saw a lot of young talented players and a lot of potential and I believed in the task. I started on a, on a short term task of nine months but immediately we could change fortunes. We had two draws against Algeria who became later a European of African champion against uh, uh, Tol who we drew and against Benin we won. And, uh, and extended my contract for two years. Um, and Gambia is the smallest uh, African country on the mainland. It's smaller than uh, uh, Iswatini, former Swaziland, small, smaller than Lesotho. Uh, so it's really a small country, about two million inhabitants, but it's a football crazy country. People love the game. There's a lot of talent. People are living for football. And, and that's what also what I loved. And step by step, together with the federation, with the staff, with the players, we built on this. And uh, it was a long journey, already two and a half years. In that journey, I used about 50 players and about 34 players made their debut under me. Um, but step by step, we, we created this result. And it's, it was very surprisingly, if you look, uh, that we had to play uh, pre-qualification to get mm -hmm. into the qualification. Uh, we were 172 ranked in the world uh, when I started. And that means there's only 211 countries, so not many countries were behind us. 39 countries were behind us on the world ranking. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had to play pre-qualification to start in this qualification round. And we had even some problems with Djibouti. We, we, we went through by, by penalties and then came in a very tough group with uh, the likes of uh, Dio Congo at that time, 56 in the world. Uh, Gabon at that time, 83 in the world, and Angola, 120 in the world. Three countries who were competing in the last AFCON in 2019. All three countries were qualified for the tournament. And we came as a low-ranked team out of the pre-qualification and won the group. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was uh, was a big surprise for everyone. We built it in that. We, we, we worked step by step. Our first match in Angola, we won 1-3. And that was the first ever competitive away win for Gambia in history. Wow. Uh, and from that moment, the confidence came. Um, and, and we built it on that. We stayed always on top of the lock and, and we qualified as number one ahead of three countries uh, who, who are in the last AFCON who are much higher ranked than us. And we are the worst, the lowest ranked African team who ever qualified for AFCON. So it makes it even extra special. Yeah, it's an amazing achievement. And if I'm not wrong, in that qualifying group, you'd, you'd even qualified with a game to spare. It wasn't even, you know, you know, really tight at the end. You were you were kind of dominating and, and very comfortable in that. Um, I think I also just wanted to go back a bit earlier to this year because obviously the, the Af African uh, AFCON U20 tournament, um, Gambia also did brilliantly um, coming coming third and and having an amazing tournament. Is there is there something is that indicative of something that's going on in the federation of kind of a, a bigger movement of building kind of a better process for Gambia? Because, you know, yeah, Gambia has no right to be at the Africa Cup of Nations, has no right to be coming third as at the U20. Um, so kind of. Can you tell us a bit about what's what's been going on to, to bring about that incredible success? 
I have to say that on youth level, Gambia had quite a good history. Also in 2004, they qualified for the World Cup. Uh, in 2005, uh, even in the under-17 World Cup, uh, mm -hmm. they, they beat Brazil and Qatar in 2005 in Peru. Wow. Uh, also in 2010, they were with the under-17 and under-20 on the African Cup level and, and achieving high. Uh, so they have always a history with, with good, talented youth. Uh, also now, again, our federation does a great job. Our under-20 coach, uh, Mataram Boch, and, and technical director, Sang and Dong, they are building step-by-step step on a good uh, development, and, and they are doing that for, for many years. Um, but Gambia had always good players. Even in the beginning of the 2000s, there were a lot of players playing in Europe. If you look back uh, to the formations in the last 20 years, it were almost always uh, full foreign-based players. Mm -hmm. um, the difference now was that uh, when we came, uh, we had the guts to to change a lot. We, we went for young talent. I give you an example. Ibrima Kali, currently in Spacia, but owned by Atalanta Bergamo, mm -hmm. made in, uh, in March 2019 his debut against Algeria in a qualifier. Eight months before he made his debut in a first team on club level. So he was a youth wow. player in his club, but he made his eight months before that, that he made his debut in, in club on the first team level. He made his debut in national team. So we were not scared uh, to invite young players um, to give them opportunities and to build the team. We have some experienced players because it's necessary, but we have a lot of young talent. And uh, step by step, we build on that. And Gambia has, has, is, is a football-loving country. People play football everywhere, on the streets, on the beach. Uh, the clubs are, are trying to develop players. There's also some international interest in, in building academies and developing players to sell to Europe. At this moment of time, Gambia has over 130 players playing in Europe. Wow. Uh, it, it, it's, it's amazing. It's, okay, some players are born in Europe, some went as refugee to Europe, but many went, were scouted as, as a talent, a young talent, and got to Europe. Some play for big teams as AS Roma, Sampdoria, Bologna, but others play in, 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 in Estonia or in Finland, second or third division, or even in Armenia. I mean, for everyone, a different level, but we have so many players playing abroad. And it's only good for the development of football. And I think the federation uh, plays a key role in it. Uh, my experience is that this federation supports very well uh, all the coaching uh, staffs of each team. Uh, they give the people the confidence, the freedom to work. And uh, it results in good results, both with under 20 and uh, senior national team. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that sounds incredible. And, and like a model to follow in terms of trying to develop a, a proper footballing footballing nation that that's that's brilliant um so we mentioned earlier that uh for the afcon you had to do pre-qualifiers with just you know seven or eight other teams and and came through it against Djibouti for so for for the you know even before the the proper uh, qualification started you also had to do the same for the world cup and 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 in that case got knocked out and so that means that you guys haven't been playing world cup qualifiers like the rest of the teams at the afcon um, and so you haven't had a competitive fixture since I think March. So how has that affected your preparation for the tournament when, you know, you've been trying to get friendlies with different, different teams? How has that affected things? Yeah, first of all, it's very sad that uh, we had to play in 2019, September 2019, a pre-qualification match uh, to qualify for the qualification of the World Cup 2022. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's quite unfair also looking to the fact that we had to play a country as Angola, uh, what was uh, uh, 50 positions better on the world ranking than us. Later, we beat them twice in the, in the Africa yeah. qualification group, but in the World Cup qualifiers, we lost against them. And after one uh, or after two matches, after one FIFA break, our World Cup was over. And it's very disappointing because uh, I think for every country, you want to compete as long as possible and, and have competitive football. Uh, it was very tough. In, in one way that that you don't find easy opponents uh, i know that in our in our country some people were asking why we don't play against the, the big african countries but they forgot that all the big african countries were playing world cup qualification mm -hmm. games so it was difficult to find uh, friendlies first of all we went on training camp in, in turkey in june that was before the world cup qualifier start we had three games there against kosovo togo and niger it was a very good camp uh, which we studied I, I i invited some new players i used this these these last uh, months also to, to screen some new players, some young talent players who didn't come before. Mm -hmm. Also some players who were previous in the squad. Um, 
to give them a new opportunity to show their real abilities. So we used uh, that period for that. In September, luck, unlucky, we had no budget. Uh, that's also a problem of a small country as, as mm. Gambia. We are uh, financially limited, so we couldn't play any friendly, not any game, not have any camp uh, in September. But then in October, we had a training camp in, in Morocco where we played Sierra Leone and South Sudan in official FIFA friendly. And then the last camp in Dubai in, in uh, November, uh, we had also limited funds. We couldn't play two games, but at least we played against a strong nation. I really demanded for that. A New Zealand uh, champion from Oceania, a uh, very European style, physical, strong team mm -hmm. uh, with a big chance. To qualify for the next World Cup in Qatar, um, so uh, it was a very good, uh, tough task because we we were really looking also at playing Kosovo and, and and New Zealand for teams who have a different style of playing. Mm -hmm. uh, we could easily play against small nations. We could have only played against Seychelles and Mauritius, with all respect for these countries, and probably had victories. But we wanted to 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 make it difficult for ourselves. We wanted to have some competition. We were not able to play against the powerhouses of African football. But at least I think we used it uh, optimal with the limitation of uh, finances that we had. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm satisfied. I could analyze my players. I could analyze my team. We could develop. And now we are on the straight line. Uh, one last 10 days before AFCON, we will hopefully play two games. One is already confirmed. We will play 1st of January in Doha, Qatar against Algeria, okay. uh, the champion of Africa. And uh, a nice... Uh, um, a note on that is that Gambia is the only country in the world who didn't lose from Algeria in the last three and a half years. Wow. Um, there are countries who drew against them, but they, they lost the second match. Yeah. And we drew twice against Algeria, so we never lost against them. Uh, so that will be an extra di dimension for that friendly. And it will be also a very good test going into Afghan and knowing that we're going to play another powerhouse there like Tunisia. Mm. Yeah, no, that's that's really good to hear that you've been able to use the time as kind of as well as, as you possibly could, even though, yeah, it's such a difficult situation kind of starting the World Cup qualification before even the AFCON and, and kind of the challenges that presents, particularly the smaller nations. Um, so kind of uh, obviously you don't want to give away too much as the coach um, going into the tournament, but can, can you tell us a bit about how you've kind of set up tactically for um, and how the kind of football you guys have tried to play and, and what's brought about the kind of success that, that you've you've had? in terms of on the yeah, field? The, the most important thing when I arrived was um, to, to create a, a strong structure, a good organization. Uh, Gambians could always play good football, but uh, conceded always more goals than that they scored. Mm. Uh, we are offensively so strong. We have so many players in top teams in Europe uh, performing quite well. Uh, but uh, if you want to succeed, you need a good organization. I always say if you build a house, you need a good fundament before you hang the flat screen on the wall or the painting on the wall. Mm -hmm. and, and that we did. So uh, the reason we qualified was because we were well organized. We, we didn't concede unnecessary goals. And uh, we could wait sometimes long before we could score that final goal. It will be very important for us. And there's no guarantee. But if we who want to be successful in AFCON, that we have that patience and that we never underrate, never underestimate our opponents. Mm -hmm. uh, the moment we as Gambia are going to think that we are better than the opponents, we can lose from everyone. The moment we, we, we play well organized with respect for the opponent, we can beat everyone. So the last three and a half years, I have to say we won 11 matches um, between 2008 and 2018. Uh, mm -hmm. Gambia had five different coaches and it's about 10 to 11 years. Gambia won in this 10 to 11 years, nine matches. Mm -hmm. In the last three years, we won 11 matches. Uh, and we, 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 we played countries as, as Guinea, uh, like Guinea, Conakry, Togo, uh, Angola, Gabon, uh, Morocco. We won in Morocco uh, with the likes of Ziyech and everything. We won 0-1 there. Uh, as I said earlier, we drew twice against uh, Algeria with Mares, Unas, uh, Slimani, Feghuli. So we mm -hmm. are competitive with the strong teams. But we can also lose from any team mm -hmm. the moment we, we don't respect the tactical discipline. So it will be very important um, that even if we have a lot of uh, offensive qualities, that we never uh, underrate the opponent and that we always respect our tactical discipline. And um, our aim to AFCON is we are there to learn. Uh, mm -hmm. It would be ridiculous to put high goals because we never played on that level, never had that experience. Uh, and in our group, we are with Tunisia, Mali and Mauritania, uh, three countries 
who uh, were also active in the last AFCON. Mauritania is maybe the less known for, for many people outside Africa, but is a quality group. Uh, mm. They built for many years on this team, uh, were competitive in AFCON, uh, were competitive in Chan, uh, the local base tournament, and many players are in the local base league and even competing now in the FIFA Ara Cup where they beat in the first round also a strong football nation in Syria. Uh, Mali is, is a country who can Very aim strong. even for, for World Cup level and, and and, uh, for, for semi-finals and Tunisia is a potential African champion who was in 2018 on the World Cup so we are the underdog in this group um, and, and we have to understand that that's our position but uh, we will start with the aim to, to do our best uh, mm -hmm. to try to win every match what's not realistic and on the end we will see what's our maximum but my goal as coach is, is more that this is our first Africa Cup but it must not be our last. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason I also select of a lot of young players is that I'm building on the future of Gambian football. I believe in the coming years, the coming five to ten years, Gambia can become a respected African football nation uh, to compete with the best. And, and that's also the, in, the, the instake of this uh, tournament. Uh, we don't want to put the, the aims or the ambitions too high, but we are there to learn to become stronger for 2023, 2025, and why not for the World Cup of 2026? Mm -hmm. No, that's that's brilliant. Well, thank you so much for sharing your your insights. It's been it's been really great to hear. I I just have one last question, and as again as the coach, you you might not want to answer, but could you just give because Gambia will probably be the team that people are most unfamiliar with. Are there one or two or three players that, that have been important in qualification that you just want to say, maybe keep an eye out if you're watching, you know, these are the really talented guys coming from Gambia or keep an eye out for these guys? First of all, I have to say that all my players were uh, uh, the same importance for the qualification. This mm -hmm. is a team performance. This is a performance of all players, all staff members, the federation, everyone who supported us. Uh, so there's not really an individual talent um, who made us qualify. A few notes, if you look pure to statistics, uh, since I arrived the last three and a half years, Asan Sise, our striker, scored 11 goals on national team duty and scored also the most important goal in the history of Gambian football. The goal against Angola, what qualified us, is at this moment of time very successful in the Swiss top league with FC Zurich leading the lock and scored also 11 goals this season there with nine assists. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's performing well. More known probably in the in the worldwide public is, is at this moment of time Musa Barrow, um, who is doing very well in Serie A for Bologna, former Atalanta Bergamo player. I think also about the young lad uh, Ibrima Darbu, who is uh, with Mourinho at AS Roma, who made last year his Europa Cup debut in the semi-final against Manchester United. But we have a lot of young players, Ablai Jallo, Ibrima Colli, so many players. We have some players with, with English Premier League experience like Modo Barrow, uh, Omar Colli, the captain who played for Sampdoria, central defender. So it's a mixed team with so many players. And I mentioned now five, six, and I miss out so many other players because mm -hmm. we we are a team who can only win as a team, who can perform as a team. Uh, and actually some players will get more, uh, more piece, a bigger piece of the cake of the glory. Uh, because they are uh, playing in a bigger league or they scored a goal, uh, but we only can achieve it as a team. Thanks to Tom for his brilliant insight, and we wish him and his side all the best in this maiden voyage in the African Cup of Nations 2021. That's all from us at our preview products, but not from all of us at the AFCON. We will continue to bring you roundups, analysis, interviews, and much more as we continue our coverage of Africa's finest tournament. If you like what you've been hearing, please do like, subscribe, and share our content, and please leave us a review. Otherwise, have a great day.